Um, I should have that person speak to my family. <laughs> when, I got, when, I, when I was going to leave for the airport yesterday, I can assure you, no one was sorry to see me leave. <laughs> it was a long weekend in the Plucker house. So um, I'm the ninth speaker at the end of a very intense day. So I know you're all thinking, oh, I hope he talks about policy. I really hope he talks about policy. I'm going to, just for you. Um, um, and uh, I'll tell a few jokes just to get those 10 people who snuck out as soon as I started walking up here. There's actually 11. Um, this has been such an amazing day. I just have pages of notes uh, of all the things I've learned from everyone else, from the conversations I've been having with people on, on, um, on the side. Uh, I just wanted to very quickly run through some of them, kind of my obligation as the last person, things I thought were kind of cool are very cool, uh, and I'm going to talk about, 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 about some of these issues. Um, uh, Richard talked about sort of the ethics. So knowing what we know, knowing what we can do, then asking ourselves, should we do those things? Or under what conditions? Like pharma pharmacological approaches to increasing human performance. Man, that's a, that's a thick issue, isn't it? Um, but we're so close to being able to do it. This, this is not a question for 20 years in the future. It's a question for now. I think that's absolutely fascinating. Um, uh, Alyssa talked about sort of explicit versus implicit learning. Uh, so much of what we talk about in educational psychology is really applications of what we know about explicit learning, but we really do tend, especially on the policy side of things, to kind of punt implicit. It's such an important part of human learning, especially for, for, for excuse me, for um, uh, younger students. Um, Katie, the whole language versus race thing, I thought was absolutely fascinating. Um, uh, I study a lot of things that have to do with race, and the fact that language could be a more important variable at certain stages of human development. I just think that's really interesting. Um, and uh, Katie, I also, um, I was surprised by the frogs. When the frog came up, I literally would have grabbed both frogs because I literally sat there and thought to myself, I didn't see that coming. I, I thought they were going to pop back up or something. I didn't think they were going to come at me. So that was really cool. Uh, Bruce and Alan, you, made, you both com combined made me think. Um, there's a research team at um, Otago in uh, New Zealand and the Harvard, I think it's the Institute for Astrophysics. Um, so you know how you see all those Hubble Space Telescope pictures, and the colors are just amazing? Uh, the colors are all added afterwards. Those, those are all black and white pictures for the most part. Uh, I know what you're thinking, because I said the same thing to them. That can't be right. I was telling them that it couldn't be right, which is kind of funny. Um, and they were like, no, we, we took them. They're black and white. Uh, so they're actually doing studies now to see which coloring schemes are, are, um, are the most effective at helping adults process the information of what's in the picture, which seemed to me to cut across actually several of the talks today, the, um, but from a very visual perspective. So I thought that, that was really interesting. Um, uh, Brenda's point that students write more than ever, I make that point anecdotally all the time, and everyone tells me I'm wrong. So now I'm right. Yes. Um, uh, it doesn't happen too often. Uh, 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 and personally, I was very glad to see that we have lifelong neuroplasticity. I'm going to assume it's in everything, even though you didn't say that. I'm going to tell that to my family, though. Um, uh, and this next sentence will be the only time you hear me use the sentence, mid-fusiform gyrus. <laughs> About six other people used it. I don't know what it is. It just sounds really important. Like, man, Bob lost his mid-fusiform gyrus. I mean, like, I would immediately think, that's Bob's in bad shape. No clue what that means. Um, so, as Amy said, I, a lot of my work uh, historically has been basic research on things like uh, creativity and problem solving, intelligence, uh, high uh, performance. Uh, but about a decade ago, I started to get extremely frustrated that we know so much about so many things to do with human performance, human learning, student learning especially. And yet, if I go into schools, I see almost none of that research reflected. Um, a, a lot of nodding heads around the room right now. You've all seen this, right? And so I really started to study and think about why is this happening? Is it us as researchers? Is it teachers? Is it students? Is it the way we've set the system up? 
Uh, I'm going to try to make the case that it's come uh, sort of a combination of all of those things. But and then I'm going to give an example from the work that we've done with excellence gaps. Um, and because there's not a lot of time, I'm going to cut to the chase. So most, I think this is a very safe assumption. Most basic research uh, does not influence practice in meaningful ways. Um, uh, and that's not just in uh, learning research. I found this great quote just last week. Uh, it's an editorial in Science. I'll let you read that very quickly. In other words, global warming is bad. Really bad. We, and we're, we're really sure that it is. You want to guess what year this is from? I know you didn't say 1906, but that's what it actually sounded like from across the room. It's a little bit more recent than that. It's the 50th anniversary of this report. 50th anniversary. Um, uh, so we could go across the sciences and find plenty of examples of basic research, even applied research, that just didn't have a huge impact. Um, uh, for all of our sake, I hope this starts to have an impact soon. But um, I think education is a little bit different and that it's highly politicized. And it's not surprising, right? Most state budgets, the biggest line item is for education. There's, everyone has a stake in it. Everyone has a stake in it from a financial point of view, from a future year of the next generation point of view, from an economic point of view. So it's going to be heavily politicized. I was once at a dinner that a university threw. I was a fly on the wall. And this university president called me and said, hey, can you just, can you just be there? It's going to be great. We're going to do a series of dinners on increasingly controversial topics. We're going to bring all the major state and thought leaders together. We thought we'd start with a straightforward one like education. <laughs> um, and I was like, sure, be fun. And um, about 15 minutes into it, 15, 20 minutes into it, the state, the state school chief was sitting on this side of him, and the, the head of the House Education Committee was sitting on this side. And they weren't just yelling and swearing at each other. They had that half out of their chair thing, which is like the sign of incredible anger. And they were both leaning over the president, and they were yelling so hard, I was on the exact opposite side of the room. It's like the, the best slash the worst possible place to sit. And you could see the saliva flying back and forth. They were just letting each other have it. No, because you hate teachers, and you want them all to die. It was crazy stuff like that. And, oh, you're just a shill for the corporate blah, 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 blah. They were going back and forth, and they were going back and forth, and it did look a little bit like this. And um, I just remember locking eyes with the university president. He, he just did one of these. <sighs> um, uh, it's a highly politicized area, and uh, this is one of our major barriers. That said... The art of policy is to deal with that politicization, politicization and actually help create positive change. And that's why we study policy. That's, that's really the primary reason. It's a sore spot for everyone. These are all questions you've asked, you've heard people ask, or you've thought to yourself. Uh, why are, uh, researchers ask, why, aren't teach, uh, why are teachers doing these things that we know don't work? Or why aren't they doing these things that we know will work? I hear that constantly. From practitioners I hear, why don't they give us things that work? <laughs> and policymakers, why don't researchers do anything useful? Do we really know anything? Um, I've, had, I've heard, I actually have heard more than one senior policymaker at the state level, which is where most of education policy takes place. Um, I've heard more than one say, ah, research, you researchers make it say whatever you want to say. And in education, that's not totally an unfair thing to say. Um, so it is a sore spot for everyone. How do we make this leap from the things we know, the things we're studying, to create positive change that really helps students learn? So let's start with a classic example, learning styles research. Very well established that there are different learning styles, right? You've all taken thinking and learning style inventories. I had someone come up to me, is it the Myers-Briggs that has the four letters? And someone came up to me literally last week and was like, I'm a blah, 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 what are you? 
And I thought, I can't believe you're even asking me this question. And so I just made up four letters. And they were like, oh, okay, that's cool. Cool. I know, I know there's like a J and an N in there somewhere. I added an F and a D. Is that close? I don't know. Uh, the research on the Myers-Briggs is not good at all, right? But anyway, we also know that we can carefully align instruction, instruction, curriculum, and assessment to address those learning styles. Uh, there's a, I was going to say a cottage industry. It's bigger than a cottage industry of people who have worked really hard to help us align those things. But what's the big problem with all this work? There's almost no evidence that those modifications improve student learning. Very few studies find any, any evidence whatsoever. Um, so we know they're there. It's one of those things we kind of want to believe. People think in different ways, therefore, if we tailor instruction to those different ways, great things are going to happen, except great things don't happen. They all tend to learn about the same as they did before. Counterintuitive, but that's why we do research, right? See if the things that we assume actually matter. In this case, they don't matter that much. Um, and yet, I found this great study about a week and a half ago where they went to different countries and they surveyed teachers about what they called neuromyths, things that we know from a neuropsych perspective, a neurocognitive perspective, are not true, but often get mistranslated into practice. Learning styles was by far the most widely believed myth, 93 to 98% in every culture they went to. And they went all over the world which I thought was absolutely fascinating. They didn't survey Americans. I'm pretty sure it would be close to 100% here. So we would not be on the low end of that scale. So why do we have this gap? Why do we have this gap? Uh, Howard Jones has this great article where he goes through different things. It's probably not malicious. No one's going out and saying, I'm going to purposefully mistranslate basic research, or I'm purposely going to do research that no teacher could ever implement. I don't think that's ever happened. Um, uh, so it's not... It's not malicious. Many of these misperceptions, many of these neuromyths, many of these learning myths, there is a kernel of accuracy to them. And they just get blown way out of proportion. Um, we do tend to talk to each other primarily in our own special languages. Uh, we're all guilty of that. Uh, I once sat through a three hour seminar with a bunch of philosophers and legal scholars. And uh, um, I shouldn't say I bumped into him in the men's room on the way out. Afterward, I was talking to a colleague who was like, what do you think about all that? And I was like, I didn't understand a single word anyone said the whole time. And he was like, yeah, but if you had talked about your statistical stuff, we wouldn't have understood a word that you would have said the whole time, which I thought was a really interesting point. We have to be cognizant of the language that we're using or we're, or we're kind of speaking above the heads of everybody. Uh, and teachers have their own jargon, too. Uh, this is a two-way street. Uh, so this is a great example. I, um, I read an article in Science over the holidays about uh, concept learning. And it was really fascinating. And it was very complicated. I'm going through it. It took me a long time to work through all these charts and details. And I missed that the last sentence of the abstract uh, was the only place where it really pointed out that they were studying learning of mollusks. <laughs> and so I'm reading this entire article going, Wow, I just how, how, how can we use this insightful research with the kids that we're using? And it was when I went back and I was like, they don't talk about the schools they went to or how many kids were involved. And then I saw mollusks and I was like, whoops. Um, so in case you're wondering, I just wanted to provide that helpful bit of jargon. Um, although it just occurs to me, well, this is embarrassing. Um, that's a plate of mollusks about to be eaten. So that's, if you have a mollusk in your family, I should have given you a trigger warning, I think. So I apologize for that. Um, uh, or in some cases, we tend to oversimplify some of our work. Um, some of the classic work, say, on ability grouping. Is it better to group students by ability or to group them heterogeneously? If you read the actual studies, the actual original studies, huge meta-analyses involving hundreds if not thousands of studies over decades. They kind of have a middle ground approach, but when the people who did the studies then go out and write popular articles for teachers about them, it's amazing how black and white everything becomes. Oh, grouping's the worst thing you could possibly do to kids. 
or groupings awesome for everybody. Well, you know what? The truth's in the middle there. Uh, some circumstances for some kids, some contexts. Uh, but we tend to oversimplify those things, and uh, we create these huge, again, we're, politi we're politicizing things that were, are already by nature politicized. And then uh, a lot of it is a healthy dose of uh, wishful thinking. So I did talk to one principal once, and uh, we were talking, I think it was about ability grouping, and we were trying to talk about, you know, sort of ways that the research supports that she should be organizing classrooms and scope and sequence of curriculum and instructional strategies, and then she finally just said, uh, you know what, I, we're just not going to group. And I was like, well, but you're kind of grouping by age anyway, right? And, well, yeah, but I just feel it in my heart. It's wrong. And I thought, well, okay, but uh, it was like a 500 study meta analysis. So you can believe what you want in your heart, but the research kind of points us in this direction. She was like, I just can't believe that that's how kids work. Um, so was she being mean spirited? Was she out to get kids? Of course not. Of course not. Uh, but we run into these well entrenched myths that are well meant but really prevents some of this research from being applied in very meaningful ways. Uh, those are all good examples. And then political considerations. I was talking to a U.S. Senator once, and he said, I just, I just don't understand charter schools. My party is really in favor of them. I need to understand the research better. And so we prepared tons of briefing documents for him. And to his credit, he read absolutely everything. Came back to us with questions. I had this great meeting with him. As I left, his education aide took me aside and said, oh, that was great. Thanks so much. I was like, oh, great. He goes, but you do realize he's never going to vote for what you told him to vote for, right? And uh, I was stupid enough to say, why wouldn't he? I made it so clear. And she goes, because he has to get reelected, and you don't. Political considerations, they are real. Uh, so I love this Pashler quote. He was specifically talking about, uh, learning, um, about, about learning and thinking styles research. If education is to be transformed to an evidence-based field, not only do we have to identify techniques that have experimental support, but also identify those widely held beliefs that affect the choices made by practitioners, but that lack empirical support. So we could have the best basic and applied research in the world. If we're not working on the policy and on the implementation sides to find ways to get that spoonful of sugar, people are never going to make those very important changes. Um, so this is how we'd like it to work. It's really simple. This is kind of how it works, as in all the time. And really what I'm here talking about today is sort of this. How do we unpack that messy middle that keeps all this great work we've been hearing about today from making huge impacts actually in classrooms or after school settings, anything like that. So a case in point, I'm going to talk about excellence gaps, some of the work that we've done. Um, many policymakers, many educators really strongly believe that we're dealing with equity or excellence. You can't do both. I've walked into plenty of meetings of principals and superintendents where they've said, oh, this excellent stuff is really interesting. We're only concerned about equity or vice versa. I've heard a lot of policymakers say that too. Um, interestingly, uh, the, the national and state level data says we're not doing a great job with equity or excellence. So I would argue that after this American experiment, 100 years of doing either or, the fact that neither has worked it's probably a good time for us to step back and say, hey, maybe we can do both, like most other countries are trying to do both right now. Um, uh, most policymakers just get a blank look when I say that. Uh, uh, most policymakers and most, and I, from policymakers, I'm defining it very broadly. Everyone from a high school English department head to the President of the United States is a policymaker. They're making policies, they're implementing policies, they're evaluating policies. Uh, in general, most educators and policymakers lean in the, equity, uh, in the equity direction and not in that middle ground. Uh, yet the data that I'm going to share in a minute um, suggests that a lot of our sort of economic excellence indicators, like patents, 
The last five years is the first time in American history that non-residents had more U.S. patents than U.S. residents. So that's not citizens. That's a much, uh, that's a much more restricted group because we import a lot of our talent from other countries on visas and make them residents. Uh, it's how this country has grown. That's a great thing. Uh, but if you pulled out just citizens, the gap would be huge. Uh, workforce data is not trending positively. We do, we, we, do, we do have an excellence problem. And we have really good basic and applied uh, research on high performance. How do we help people uh, become experts? Uh, we have decades of research on this now, uh, on everything from chess to math to writing, uh, the arts, music. Um, we have really good data on this. Uh, we're not getting it into schools. How do we bridge that gap? My team was growing very frustrated with that. Um, so, what we first decided to do was just share some of the outcome data with policymakers. Uh, based on the uh, belief that they may not be familiar with it. Um, or, in, or if they were, it was much worse than they thought it was. I had one policymaker tell me over email not 48 hours ago that uh, she knows that the changing demographics of American schools are something that has to be addressed. And she said, you know, because four or five years ago, it was uh, K-12 public schools was about 81% Caucasian students. And she goes, you know, and now it's down to 70. <laughs> Do you know what the actual percentage is? Like 52%. When people say the country is going to become more diverse, that happened a generation ago. The country is extremely diverse. Our schools, our approaches to learning, our policies haven't caught up with it yet. Um, so we just wanted to expose them to the data to see if that helped. Uh, we focused, again, mostly on state policymakers because that's where the majority of these policies, especially with the new No Child Left Behind, ESSA, uh, it's putting a lot more of this back on states. So that's even going to increase. And to a point, we had some success. And let me, uh, this is a pretty funny story. So I got a call. I'm not going to tell you what state it was. Um, let's call it the state of Rensselvania. It's totally <laughs> hypothetical. And I got a call from the governor's chief of staff. She was on her cell phone driving somewhere, and she ripped into me like there was no tomorrow, which when you, if you do policy work, that's part of the, that's part of the game. You're going to get yelled at sometimes. And she let me have it. And she was like, your report on excellence gaps came out, and you said that our state has huge gaps and that our state standards are really weak, and how dare you? He is furious. I literally cannot tell you what most of what she said was, because what was I thinking at that point? The governor of Pennsylvania read my report. <laughs> I was so happy. It wasn't funny. I was like, yes, victory. And he got angry. That's good. And then she finally calmed down and stopped. She's like, do you have a response? And I'm like, well, I think the report lays it out. I, your state standards, according to your state standards, your state assessment said that 80% of Pennsylvania students are gifted. I think you and I both know it's probably a lower number than that. And if everyone's gifted, it really masks huge racial and income disparities. I just, I'm not sure you're doing those kids a favor. I didn't even finish that sentence and she said, oh, we all know you're right. I just need to tell them that I yelled at you. And she hung up on me. <laughs> Oh, I love it. So I tell that story every chance I can get. <laughs> he is no longer governor. But um, uh, several federal agencies started to pick up on the idea of excellence gaps. And I know I haven't shown in you any excellence gap data yet. I'm going to do that in the next slide. Um, uh, but several, fe uh, several federal agencies, uh, National Science Foundation specifically, was one of the first ones to pick it up and go, yeah, maybe, maybe we haven't paying and been paying enough attention to the excellence side of things. Um, which we thought was good. Um, many think tanks at that time, so this is about seven or eight years ago, were really focused on equity in education. Um, so they hated this work. And so we spent a lot of our time fending them off, which wasn't happy. Um, so this is one of our latest reports. Uh, so this is one of the two major international assessments. Uh, we like Tim's more than the other one, but it doesn't matter. Um, the data is roughly the same. 
Uh, so this is the percentage of students who score advanced on this particular test. So on your left is grade four math, and on your right is grade eight math. I helpfully pointed out where the United States was for you. Science is actually a happier story. In grade four, we're among the world's leaders in scientific achievement excellence in grade four. But by grade eight, we have greatly slid down the chart. This is a state by state, huge state, huge state variations in terms of excellence. Um, this is your traditional stoplight. Uh, green is good. You have a lot of students in your state scoring at the most advanced levels on these various tests. This is the uh, NAEP test, pretty much the national test. Uh, very, very high quality assessment. Um, so some green, a little yellow, grade four math, grade eight math, that's actually better. That's actually better. A lot, a lot, a lot more yellow, a lot, a lot less red. This is grade four reading. It's grade eight reading. You may not have noticed the difference between the last two, so I'll show this to you again. <laughs> a lot of yellow and not so much. Not so much. Um, you know, I've asked the Nate people why they think that's the case. And uh, one thing is that when you get into grade eight, it really is more about using the ability to read. So we're getting more into language arts here. Um, uh, and we really don't do a great job teaching things like writing anymore. Um, so uh, that was a really broad sweeping statement. But um, so that could be it. But uh, there's no question that uh, positive direction in math, negative direction in uh, reading. Uh, so this is the percentage of students who score advanced by racial or ethnic group. Uh, the top line is Asian American students. Next one down, white students. Uh, next one after that, Hispanic, Native American, African American students. African American students. So, um, and this was predictable, with no child left behind, uh, students who responded best to the interventions were students who were best prepared to begin with, which many psychologists predicted would happen as soon as the law was passed. That's exactly what happened at the top end, too. Interestingly, we've seen achievement gaps at that basic and or proficient level, what we call the minimum competency level, actually have shrunk a little bit. They've kind of stabilized now. We're not making any more progress there. But we did make progress. On the top end, the exact opposite happened. Uh, and if we use raw scores, percentile scores, they tell slightly different stories, but it all looks roughly like this. Very big gaps. Uh, the difference, for example, between the average 90th percentile African-American student and the average 90th percentile Caucasian student, I believe, is two and a half grade levels. At the top end, two and a half grade levels. That's a massive, massive gap. And that's a ton of lost opportunity in this country. Um, most policymakers, most superintendents, most educators, we show these data and they just kind of go, what? No, it can't be this bad. Oh, it's been this bad for a long time. It really, it really has been. This is kind of a blow up of those lower three groups because they tend to get um, compressed. I did, I did have a colleague um, say, say to me once that uh, technically the percentage increase from zero to three percent is bigger than the percent increase from <laughs> 10 to 22 percent. Um, I have many pithy one-liners on that. Um, <laughs> And I'm going to pass. And she is technically correct, because the increase from 0 to 3% is infinity. So um, the fact that I actually uh, have to explain that to people sometimes is ironic, since it's math scores that I need to express <laughs> how infinity works. But um, uh, that's all right. That's all right. Um, numeracy is important, too. Uh, so we're seeing progress, but we're seeing so little progress. So little progress. Um, uh, and this is absolutely true. Uh, this is science. Uh, 2011 is the most recent data we've had because <laughs> the Fed stopped testing in science. This is the United States of America. We don't test in science. Just let that percolate a minute. Huh? Um, and maybe we stop testing because that's the percentage of students who score advanced in this country in science. Wow. So we don't have huge excellence gaps in science. 
much like we don't do in eighth grade reading and language arts, because so few of our students actually perform at high levels. So we see this as bringing together the concepts of equity and excellence, bringing those two things together, in that we have equity issues all up and down the achievement spectrum. Uh, no point on that spectrum is any more or less important than any other. Um, like, uh, so we, these, are really, these are really critical issues for us. So phase two, we did a second report, uh, and we really dropped out the things that we thought were scientifically interesting, but that no one responded to. So we really tried to hone our message. What weren't we translating into practice? What was wrong with our message the first time around? We kept in the stuff that got Rensylvania's knickers in a twist. That was all in there, amplified. Um, we really focused on that. Uh, we took out a lot of the stuff that scientifically was probably technically more precise uh, because it was a little too much for policymakers. Policymakers are very smart people. They just don't have time. They have no time. So they have to be able to read it in five minutes or less. And the technical stuff took way too much time for them to wade through. Um, you know, explaining multiple multi-level regression models did not go over well. That stuff got pulled out. Uh, we did a lot more blogging and op-ed writing because they do read those things. And educators read those things. Um, still not a fan of the Twitter, but I do it because a lot of information gets passed around especially research on education. Uh, Twitter is one of the main communication tools now. Uh, some foundations and some federal agencies, some of whom asked us to partner with them on some various things, which we then took them up on. Um, which leads to this final phase, phase three, bedfellows, strange and otherwise. Um, uh, you may not know this, but uh, the academy does tend to skew a little bit left. I'm serious, it does. Um, and, uh, uh, but you know what? Not every policymaker is, leans to the left. So you actually, I know, I know, it's crazy. Um, but you actually have to work with them across the political aisle. And so we would bring people who we didn't necessarily agree with on 99% of topics to campus, or we'd go and meet with them. And I had colleagues who stopped talking to me because they were, how could, you, how could you bring him to campus? He's a jerk. And I remember saying to one person, I know he's a jerk, but I'm not, he's, I'm not, I didn't bring him here to date him. I brought him here because he has a great network of people that I don't know well, and we actually agree with him on this issue. Uh, so sometimes you do have strange bedfellows when you're trying to create lasting change. Um, one group that we did agree with was the Jack Kent Cooke Foundation. Johns Hopkins has been supported by the foundation. Um, they wanted to create state-by-state -state grades analyzing the degree to which this research on high performance was being integrated into state policies. Um, I thought, yeah, that's exactly what we should do. And this was like October, and they were like, great, could we release it in December? And I said, I think it's gonna take a little longer than that. Um, and so they gave me to like January. Um, so we did it, it was a very fun Christmas in the Plucker household um, as we went through those grades. Uh, we got the report done, we found some interesting things, some very practical things that states could be doing that most weren't. Interestingly, they said, well, let's go talk to the National Governors Association then. And I said, I quote, and, and, and I quote, can we do that? And they were like, of course you can. And so we've been spending much of this last six to eight months going uh, state house to state house, talking to governors and state school chiefs about how they can get this research into their schools. It's highly contextual because every state system is different. The governor of New Hampshire cannot say anything about what schools should be doing because she's considered a tyrant. Very local control. In Arizona, it's very much top down. Very different strategies. Very different strategies to use. So we've had to personalize those. And www.excellencegap.org is where this last report is. More data and infographics than you could ever look at. So you can see the types of strategies that we're trying to use. So lessons learned thus far. If you want to change education, you have to get involved with education policy. There's really no other way to do it.
There really isn't. It's messy, it's unpleasant from time to time, but that's how we move the ball forward. That said, we need as much high quality, basic and applied research as we can get our hands on. We have to be translating something uh, for translational science. We need more. So that's why all the stuff we've been hearing about today is just so awesome. We need more and more and more of this so that we can be crafting these messages and actually creating long-term change. And a good example, and I will close with this, um, there's a coalition for psychology in schools and education as part of the American Psychological Association. That's what part of the cover looks like. I do not have the technology skills to shrink it down, so I cut off the heads of several students. Um, uh, what we did was we spent two years arguing about what we really know about learning. And we came up with 20 in the end. And you're saying, why not 19? Why not 21? Because no one does a type top 19 report. So we found a 20th one, and it's the one that has to do with uh, targeted practice, with targeted practice. If you search APA top 20, this comes up immediately in Google. This comes up immediately in Google. Um, so that's pretty much it. it uh, I think uh, the, new, um, the new No Child Left Behind, uh, the Every Student uh, Succeeds Act, does provide us with a, a window that we may not see again for some time in that so much of the focus is going back to the state level now for how we create and run schools, it's much easier to influence state policy and state education practice than it is federal policy and practice. And so we do have an opening here that we haven't had for so 2002, uh, 13 years. Um, so I do think that this is a really, a really special opportunity for us. Thank you for inviting me. I very much appreciate it. And thank you for staying today. Do private schools implement these things? Those that are not bound by the state policy quite the same way. They do not. They do not. And their data is, looks almost exactly the same, believe it or not. Almost exactly the same. Yeah, yes. It, um, it seems so obvious that it would be better. We've also looked at the Department of Defense schools, um, thinking that they have a social safety net in place that a lot of other schools with similar demographics don't have. So maybe they have smaller excellence gaps, and maybe they're doing some of these things. Uh, their data look exactly the same. Exactly the same. Thank you.